invite you to bow with me as I pray the 19th Psalm. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. to the gospel. The gospel of Mark chapter 5. Two people are about to be healed who are not supposed to be healed. So get ready to be mad. When Jesus had crossed again on the boat to the other side, a great, great crowd gathered around him. And he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came and when he saw him fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly. My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be made well and live. <clears throat> Jairus is a leader in the synagogue, is one of the persecutors of Jesus in his movement. And he's not supposed to be coming and asking Jesus for help. And as a large crowd followed Jesus and pressed on him, as he followed the man to his home, there was a woman who had been suffering hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under the physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather got worse and worse. But she had heard about Jesus. And she came up behind him in the crowd and reached through the crowd and touched the hem of his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. And immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? The disciples thought this was silly. They said, Well, there's a whole crowd here pressing in on you. Everybody's touching you. And Jesus looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, realizing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Now while he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house. Remember Jairus? This is where he was headed to heal Jairus' daughter. And they said, You're too late. Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? And he allowed no one to follow him except for Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people wailing and weeping loudly. And when he entered, he said to them, Why do you take a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but only asleep. And they laughed at him. And then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk. She was about 12 years old. At this they were overcome with amazement. And he strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Here ends this reading. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> I'm getting a little uh, feedback on the mic. I don't know if anyone else is hearing that. So here are two people who are asking for help, and one asks for help, and one just takes help. And neither one of them have any business being around Jesus. So we've got to we got to understand the rules here. Jesus has ticked off most of the people in the synagogue administration. He has suggested that God loves everyone. He has suggested that maybe um, all the rules 
weren't as important. When the leaders had asked him, what's the most important rule? Because we've got 613 of them in the Old Testament. Which one is the most important? And Jesus quotes Deuteronomy, and he says, to love the Lord your God first and foremost, and your neighbor as yourself. On the, this law hangs all of the law and all of the prophets. It hangs on loving one another. If you have made your career enforcing rules, and someone tells you that your rules aren't as important as loving one another, you're not going to be happy. So the synagogue had, was, in a, was in a tither. They were very upset, going out, watching Jesus, following Jesus. But one of their leaders was desperate. And there's nothing that will push you to desperation like the illness or death of your own child. And this, this man was pushed to desperation. He didn't, suddenly nothing else mattered in his world. He didn't care about his job. He didn't care about his career. He didn't care about what his colleagues would think. He was so desperate that his daughter was dying, he went and threw himself at the enemy's feet and said, help me. And Jesus, now the disciples are looking at this thinking, uh, where have you been? You've been the problem. But Jesus says, okay. Jesus says, okay. I'll come to your house with you. This is a big problem. So the whole crowd's got to see this. They've got to see Jesus go to the head of the synagogue's house, which actually makes it all the more comical, the last sentence Jesus says, don't tell anybody what's happened. Everybody already knows. Have you ever been in a small town? Everybody already knows. Here's how I know. I was a pastor in a small town in Wathena, Kansas, and I'd been there one week. And one of the women at the church said, how are you enjoying your time in this small town? I said, it seems great. And she said, would it help if I told you I know that you've already been to the grocery store yesterday? I said, no, I don't think that would help my enjoyment. And she said, I did not ask what you had purchased, but I could have. And I made a mental note, shop selectively at the local grocery store. <laughs> Amen? So for Jesus to say, don't tell anybody, are you kidding? Everybody knows. There's a parade to the leader's house. So Jesus is leading the parade to the leader's house because they want to see what Jesus is going to do for the guy who's been sticking it to him politically for the last year or so. So while they're walking, another woman, desperate, she's been sick for 12 years, hemorrhaging for 12 years. There are rules, now this is no accident that these stories are put together like this, because there are specific rules in the Old Testament that when a woman is hemorrhaging, she's unclean. And no man can go near her. In fact, they had a little woman village in the olden times where women who were hemorrhaging would go and be by themselves for a week and then come back later because they were unclean. I think they were just sick of their husbands anyway. But the guys wrote the Bible, so they made it out that they're unclean. They're like, we don't know why our women are ditching us, but we're just going to say they're unclean. That's my interpretation. She's completely unclean, and she can't go near the synagogue and she can't go near a man. And she knows the rules. But she's been sick for 12 years. She's gone to every physician. She's spent all of her money. She can't afford her health insurance. The state of Galilee refused to expand Medicaid because they didn't give a damn about the poor. And she just thought, if, if, if he doesn't even know if I just touch him, I'll be made whole. And she touched him, and she was cured. And Jesus knew it immediately. He's like, wait a minute. 
And he starts looking around and he says, who touched me? And the disciples, the poor disciples, they never understand anything anyway, but they're like, dude, we're packed on this street. This is not a four lane, this is a small street. And we're packed with all kinds of people, everybody's touching you. But the woman realizes Jesus is looking for him. And she comes and throws herself at Jesus' feet and says, thank you, thank you. And after that commotion, the parade continues to Jairus' house. He had just, major Levitical laws had just been broken. An unclean woman just touched a man in public, and that man who is now unclean and is supposed to go through ritual purity if you touch an unclean woman, and he's not, he's going to the leader of the synagogue's house. You see what a, what a disaster parade we've got going on right here? We've got uncleanliness moving to the synagogue leader's house. And they come out and they say, you're too late. She's already dead. You shouldn't have stopped and talked to that woman. Now see the layer here? That woman had delayed Jesus from saving the girl. If it hadn't been for that woman, Jesus would have gotten there on time. But Jesus says, don't worry. Just trust. I, I don't know about you, but I find myself to be much more trusting when things are going my way. Is it just me? I, I find it much easier to trust God and to trust God's plan when God's plan is lined up with my plan, right? Because then it, God's plan makes sense to me. But when my plan and God's plan seem to be going in opposite directions, it hurts my trust. I don't know about you. This is the journey of faith, is it not? And that's when we're called to have trust, is exactly when things are going wrong. And everything just went wrong. All the rules just got broken. And he's about to break some more. And Jesus says, don't worry, just trust. I imagine the disciples. Oh. So he walks into the house with the mom and the dad. And he says to the little girl, stand up. And she's alive. And Jesus takes this fairly nonchalantly and says, make sure you give her something to eat. This child's hungry. It doesn't say what she had. What we just know is that he had, he had just healed the daughter of the people who were persecuting him. And he had, all, he had just overcome death to do it. This isn't how it was supposed to be. Everything was thrown askance. And Jesus said to everyone, no one's going to get this. Don't tell anybody what just happened. And they all absolutely did not listen to him and went and told everybody. Our nation right now is struggling under the weight of rules, and tradition and change that has been pretty seismic in the last, frankly, the last year and really heightened in the last week. It's been very troubling to watch on TV as we see things unfold in Ferguson where it looks like there's some latent racism still taking up residence in our major cities. And we like to think, certainly I like to think, we've come further than that. And yet a situation like Ferguson reminds us that we have a ways yet to go. And then a situation in New York, and then Baltimore. And it seems like, and, and here's what I don't know. Well, here's what I think. I'll tell you what I think. You can think something else, but here's what I think. I think black people have been dying at the hands of the authorities for a really long time. And video cameras have dramatically changed how we understand that. That's what I think. There was just in North Charleston 
an African-American fleeing from police who was shot in the back by a police officer, and the police officer rigged the crime scene to make it look like he had been attacked first. And if it hadn't been for a video camera, that's how the story would have been written. You have a police officer shooting a man in the back who is fleeing, a white police officer shooting a black man, and then in the same city last week, we have a very troubled, broken, young white man who has been poisoned in his heart and soul by hatred, goes and kills nine people. Is there no correlation between the police officer shooting the young man fleeing and a white man, young man killing church members? It, are, have we become so callous or is our denial so deep? And I, I, I love the phrase, denial is not just a long river in Egypt. Amen? Denial is a river that runs through our nation that helps us frame things that we don't want to be true in a way that they're not true. And when that, when that vision, you know, we can put pictures of Martin Luther King Jr. up in our, in our narthex, and we can celebrate the holidays, and we can remember all of the good things that have happened, and then when we have these dramatic events that tell us that race in America still is very broken, it's upsetting to everyone, isn't it? Even in our city, when our fire department remains the most segregated department of any department in the city. And it's 82% white, 95% male. And when we just put that slide up on the screen to say, look, it looks like in a city that's 26% African American, it's only, our fire department's only 7% African American. And our police department has about double that diversity, but it's only about 14% African American. That even in our own city, we have this gap between our public safety and our citizens. citizens. And what it does is it, it, it threatens the mythology under which we live that everything's fine. Because I want everything to be fine, don't you? And when I see numbers that break my belief system down, we have a choice. We can shoot the messenger, which has, by the way, been very popular in this city recently. Or we can address the problem. And the question I've asked people, are you more upset that we have a highly segregated fire department or are you more upset that I'm saying it out loud? Are, are, are we more upset that black people are dying at the hands of the police department nationwide or are we more upset that it's showing up on video? Right? Are, are, we, are we more upset that nine black people who offered and welcomed a stranger into Bible study were assassinated for the color of their skin, or are we more upset that people are attacking the Confederate flag? I think we need to start deciding if we're going to fly the flag of the future or the flag of the past. And part of taking down the flag of the past is symbolic. It's not just the Confederate flag that's a problem. It's the Confederate mindset that tells white people in this country that everything's fine racially and if people would stop talking about it, it would all go away. Jesus messed up people's rules. And he messed them up by saying, your rules of not liking one another, of discriminating and marginalizing women and people who don't agree with all the rules, is a sin. And really, you should be focused on loving one another. Jesus was breaking people's worldview. And there is no greater trauma than our worldview being broken. And I think the United States of America is under trauma right now because we want to believe we're further ahead in race relations than we really are. And we want to believe that we really do love first. And we really want to believe that the church is leading the way in love. This poor woman that didn't have health insurance that Jesus healed, clearly he's, that's not going to be billable. 
When polio vaccine was discovered, there was a rush in this country to vaccinate every child, rich and poor, black and white. There was no question. The organizations of the churches and the government, everybody jumped on board to make sure everybody had that polio vaccination. When HIV came around in the 80s, and being a child of the 80s, I remember when AIDS first came to America, the church and the government conspired to say, that's the gay people's fault. It's a gay disease, so we don't have to do any research to study it. And then when we found the treatment, instead of giving it to everybody, we, made, we only gave it to people with insurance. In fact, we blocked it from going to Africa because they couldn't pay for it. And that's cost a predicted 200 million deaths because of the corporate and politicalization of health care. I just want to go on record, our health care in this country has been a disaster for generations. The Affordable Care Act did not create the disaster, but it's entered into the disaster. In fact, it's probably become a part of the disaster. The Affordable Care Act is not the end-all, be-all, but I can tell you in Kansas City, Kansas, we took the uninsured in Kansas City, Kansas from 26% down to 18%. 9,000 individuals who had never had health insurance in our community have health insurance today because of the Affordable Care Act. That is a huge victory for the poor. And if we were to expand Medicaid in Kansas, we would more than double that number of people with access to health care. So the Affordable Care Act might not be perfect, and it's not. In fact, there are some fundamental flaws to it. But I would rather take this mess that provides the poor access to health insurance than take the mess before that only allowed the rich to have access. I'm going to tell you a story that I wish Jesus had been around for. We recently had a police officer called to a home by a woman who was probably in her mid-60s who was delirious, and she thought she had been shot. She was bleeding in her chest. So she called the police, and the police came, and she said, I think I've been shot. And they're like, oh my gosh, you know, where did the bullet come from? We're looking around. They called an ambulance. The ambulance came. This is downtown Kansas City, Kansas. The ambulance came and said, ma'am, you've not been shot. You have a wound. We need to take you to the hospital. She was so delirious, it took forever to get her convinced to get in the ambulance. They took her to KU Med. She was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer that was bleeding through her shirt. Because there had never been a doctor's visit for screening, there had never been a doctor's visit for a lump. There had never been a doctor's visit for when she was sick. She was delirious and bleeding through her shirt. Kansas City, Kansas leads the state of Kansas in diagnosis of stage four cancer. Why? Because too many people don't have health insurance. And if Jesus had been there, if she had walked up to the crowd and could have just touched the hem of his, of his clothes, if she could have just reached out and moved past all of the political nonsense of our health care and just touched Jesus for a moment, she would have been healed. And today she's dead. Because we politicized health care in our state and in our country. The other seismic change with Jesus helping people that you're not supposed to help, this got him in trouble. In fact, this cost him his life. Jesus saw people that other people were done with. This woman at the well who had had five husbands who wasn't supposed to talk to a man, she deputizes him to go spread the gospel. Jesus was always crossing lines that made people uncomfortable. And this historic motion, movement by the Supreme Court to allow marriage for gay and lesbian people in all 50 states has been roundly condemned by who other than the church. The loudest voice condemning this decision is the church. I'll remind you the last time the Supreme Court ruled on marriage rights, the last time the Supreme Court ruled on marriage rights, it was to overturn state bans on interracial marriage. Because a black person and a white person getting married together was illegal in this country for generations, and it still is on the books as illegal in some states. And the Supreme Court ruled 
25 years ago, 30 years ago, you can no longer discriminate marriage based on race, even interracial marriage. And who was it that was condemning interracial marriage? It was Christians who were reading the book of Joshua and the condemnation of intermarrying with people of other cultures and saying it's in the Bible that interracial marriage is wrong. The Bible was used to justify slavery. The Bible was used to condemn interracial marriage. And the Bible is being used by Christians to condemn gay and lesbian marriage. The church was wrong on slavery. The church was wrong on excluding women. The church was wrong on segregation. And the church continues to be wrong on discriminating against gay and lesbian people. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus broke down these barriers and it's people's worldview that's being shattered. It's people's worldview that's being shattered and this is where I think our nation needs prayer. Our worldview as people is based and predicated oftentimes on mythology. Okay? And mythology, I don't mean that in a pejorative way but in a positive way, that how we construct the mythology of our lives matters, and it helps us live day to day. And, it, and I'll, give you a, I'll give you a really kind of sad example. For the last 20 years during spring training, I always celebrated the fact that the Royals were undefeated, and this could be the year. Okay, that's a mythology, right? That the first month of the season usually crushed. But in a larger frame, we live in, under a mythology in our country that we're a Christian nation. Not really, but that's a part of our identity. And when we have things happen that seem not Christian, it hurts the worldview of our nation. And I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying it hurts it, right? Change is, it's a paradigm shift that's happening. If our nation were built on the Ten Commandments, then the Ten Commandments would be illegal. Do you know only two and a half of the Ten Commandments are illegal? Because stealing is still illegal, murder is still illegal, and lying is illegal if you're under oath. Apparently, if you're running for office, it's encouraged. But those are the only Ten Commandments that are illegal. Honoring your mother and father, mom and dad, not illegal. My kids know that too. It's bad. Having no God before our God is not illegal. Creating a craven image and worshiping something besides God is not illegal. Using the Lord's name in vain when you hit your thumb with a hammer is not illegal. Right? The mythology, though, is that we have a Christian nation and we've We've built it on these Christian principles. And what's interesting is the principles on which our nation are built of fairness, democracy, equality, which have been true from our founding in the 1700s, but have only become more true with every generation. All people are created equal. Is, yes? Do you, does those words sound familiar? We believe that all people are created equal. Well, it says all men are created equal, and they really did mean men. And they specifically meant white men who owned property, because those are the only ones who could vote. And so our nation has become more inclusive over time to include all people. It took 100 years after the Civil War to end slavery before the Voting Act guaranteed that everyone could vote legally in this country without being discriminated against. It wasn't until 1919 that women got the vote in this country. We have become more inclusive all the time in our country because the values that we have, I believe, are represented in the best of Christianity. I believe Christian values at their best represent freedom and equality for everyone. Those are also Jewish values. Those are Muslim values at their best. The values that we have are the values that people of faith around the world share 
and we've been fortunate in this country to live it out better than other places. Because I do believe that democracy in the United States is stronger than in other places. There are places in Africa where gay and lesbian people are being stoned to death and killed. There are places, most countries in the world, women are not allowed to vote. In fact, no one's allowed to vote. So our democracy is better, I think, I'm going to make a value judgment as an American, I think better, stronger than other countries. And so we have this mythology then, because ours is good, that there's nothing wrong with it. And when things like Charleston and Ferguson and the hatred that's coming up around the decision around gay and lesbian stuff and the issues with health care, when we see these things and people say we do not have a perfect union in the United States, it hurts people's brains and hearts because we love our country. Yes? And it's painful when we see our country fall short of the ideals and the mythology that we have lifted up for it. Because when reality hits mythology, reality always wins. And Jesus' message to the disciples when they were watching him willy-nilly break every rule, his message to them is the same message to us today. For all of us who are celebrating and for all of the people in this country who are grieving, Jesus' message is the same. Just trust. Jesus' words in that time was, be not afraid and just trust. Folks, this stuff has churned up more fear in our country. Can you feel it? Churned up more fear in our country. And Jesus' message, be not afraid and trust, could never be more real. So that's my invitation today. My invitation today is to be not afraid of sort of the seismic changes that are happening in our country and to trust that we as a people will continue to move forward in ways that are more inclusive, more caring, and more compassionate than ever before. I worry about a backlash in our country of fear and hate, and we're seeing it. Be not afraid. Trust in God. And brothers and sisters, in the name of Jesus Christ, we can all be healed. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the miracles you have worked in our midst in just the last couple of weeks. The miracle of a group of parishioners inviting a stranger into Bible study. The miracle of their family's witness of forgiveness. Lord, we thank you for the miracle of love being recognized for everyone. We thank you for the miracle of healing for those who would have never had it. Lord, help us as a nation to be not afraid. And help those of us who are Christians to answer the call of Christ to trust. To trust that even in the midst of seismic changes, you are with us. In your holy name we pray. Amen.